Hey, uh, well, this morning I am thrilled to uh, introduce our first guest, um, Hong Zhang. Uh, I don't know all the details, but I believe that she is the education director for the Snell Memorial Foundation. She's down in, uh, I think, Sacramento area this morning with us. And uh, Hong, uh, when you take over, uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, I mean, give, give some more of your background maybe than what I have. And then for everybody here, um, we're going to do something a little different. Hong's got a very nice presentation, but she's also going to do some live video feed from the Snell Foundation, and they're going to show you some testing and like that this morning. She's, she's going to do that on her telephone. So when you do that, you probably want to go up to the upper right-hand corner where it says view and go to the speaker view, and that will make whoever's speaking big in your screen. And then if you hit pin it, then uh, that will freeze that view. So no matter who's talking, you're always going to see Hong's video. Um, so that's a way to see it big and not in a little screen uh, like what you might have here. So like if you're looking at your screen now, you'll see that there's a blacked out screen that says uh, Hong Zhang, um, and that is her camera. And when she turns it on, um, then we'll go to that view. So with that, um, I'm pleased to introduce to you Hong Zhang from the Snell Memorial Foundation. Good morning. I'm Hong Zhang. I'm so thrilled that I got this opportunity to reach out to everyone here today and maybe uh, some of you will watch this video later on. I've been working at the Snell Foundation for the last 25 years, uh, moving on different positions, but mostly as the education director. So today I'm going to show you what it takes to be a snail certified helmet product oh. here through the test that uh, is done at our, only at our lab and uh, not exhaustively because we don't have that much time, but I will explain uh, how it's done. It's not just uh, the lab and it's not just the paper and also it's explain the uh, difference between uh, SA 2015 and SA 2020. And if you have any questions during this presentation, please ask. Uh, I will try my best to explain if we don't have enough time. Uh, you're, uh, we can discuss uh, offline. We are always open and talk to anybody who has an interest in helmets. Okay, I'm going to start sharing my screen and get started. Uh. And you where's the wait a minute okay everybody see the screen yes okay i need to do slideshow all right Okay, let's get started. Jump in. Uh, the Snell Memorial Foundation was established uh, a year after Pete William Snell died of a crash in Arcadia, California during the SCCA uh, racing. Uh, the helmet he had on that day unfortunately did not give him any protection. I'm going to show you that helmet later in the conference room still. It's basically um, made of uh, pressed cardboard paper bonded with white leather. You can still see the sign of SCC and the A was uh, just destroyed. Um, on the skirt here is really the stain of his blood. And as you can see, the helmet didn't have any uh, energy absorbing material there's just a suspending system like the industrial hard hats that we see today underneath this structure and a uh, strap under the chin to buckle on. So the task is on because he was um, racer of the year, very much loved by the racing community and uh, everybody had seen enough crashes and understand um, understanding of the helmet 
uh, whether it protects or not is really minimal because there wasn't any uh, helmet standard at all in the United States, it's blank. So it started out like, how do we know helmets do or don't do? And so what's good and what's not good? Um, this is just an icebreaker. Certainly even from the get-go, this was never how we managed to find out the better ones uh, people are using. This is George Snively, the one in white shirt. He's the founder of the Snell Memorial Foundation. At the time uh, when it happened, he was actually on the SCCA board and a medical doctor. He himself was an amateur racer. So he really devoted his uh, spare time basically to figure out how to uh, measure the performance in helmets through many uh, state-of-the-art equipment that he had access on at the time. As you see, this thing out here is a camera, a Polaroid camera that was fixed onto an instrument that uh, take a picture of the trace of this impact. And that's an HP camera that was really the best at the time. I found this in cleaning out the, the old items in the storage and it was thrilling <laughs> to see this push button to uh, um, operate the camera. As you can see, the timing has to be very precise. Otherwise that flash on the uh, instrument panel is just gone. This is George in his garage uh, where he had the first helmet testing equipment installed in the early 60s. And um, to honor George and his uh, contribution to the helmet safety uh, development, this is the uh, induction into the National Hall of Fame uh, by SCCA uh, six years ago, seven coming on. So back to today, the current standard is SA 2020 that began uh, effectively uh, October la uh, last uh, uh, two years now, almost a year and a half. So basically uh, with the support of the uh, racing community, different clubs have set up their own regulation on safety equipment use. And a lot of them would have already changed uh, the required headgear use to include 2020 SA label. And uh, most of them would also allow the immediate previous one, which is 2015 uh, in their events. So I'm going to quickly go over the difference between those two standard uh, differences. Uh, every time there's an update, Snell tried to improve the protectiveness in terms of how much more impact energy uh, we can ask the helmets to do based on our knowledge of what the manufacturers are able to do with the existing material and design ideas. And what we understand from the scientific and medical community, what is uh, uh, valid and uh, reasonable uh, data to show the needs. So here in the gray area is the second impact because uh, snail test uh, impact, impact test is uh, consist of uh, two impact at each location selected for impact. So here, what you see, the A, C, E, J, M, O are different size dummy head from the smallest on A to the largest on O. And here is the peak G value on the second row allowed for each head form. So here, the third row is the first impact. That's 5.5 millimeters per second velocity across the board, except in the O section uh, dummy. And uh, the second one also varies depending on the dummy size. And this 2020 has jumped from 
here, this row down here, 6.64 meters per second to 6.8 meters per second for the smaller sizes down from the medium on. And here is also jumped from 5.02 meters per second in the largest head form to six meters per second. So these largest two sizes, M and O dummies, get the most changes, okay? And uh, these across the board are changed only on the second impact, because uh, this top 5.8.5 uh, uh, meters per second is still very tough. The reason is that we, our chief engineer at Word Becker, calculated um, that we could raise these and uh, force these helmets to uh, be measured to a higher bar, but also be compatible with the uh, FIA 8859. And so this is across the board, every single size and uh, in both uh, impact on the first and second impact. Um, I, some of you may have questioned that why the heroic size headed people are uh, not getting the uh, as severe a hit on this, uh, these uh, impacts as you compare the velocity. The, the fact is that the material and the design ideas for both the large and the small helmets are the same. The, when you subject these helmet to this impact test, the impact input velocity and the mass of the dummy is what uh, deciding how much the impact energy is. The formula is uh, half of the mass times velocity squared. So since the velocity is squared and the uh, impact mass, the dummy, is so much heavier. For instance, the O head form weighs three kilograms more than the A head form. So that is a tremendous uh, blow to that helmet structure. The only way to improve more than what we're asking for is to increase the cellulite, the thickness, and the weight of the helmet, which really is pushing to the limit and how much people are willing to wear. And, uh, what's uh, practical for use. So these are the considerations uh, when uh, Snell mark up these impact uh, severity. It, it is kind of like arbitrary, but that is the reality. Wherever we draw the line is in terms of uh, uh, understanding of the needs and the feasibility in the real product. So since we see everybody's helmets out here in the lab through thousands of tests, we truly understand what's uh, from an engineering point of view, a material uh, design point of view, what's uh, technically feasible. And we push for the limit. And that is how over the last 60 some years, a snail raised by raising the bar, to whatever is the most current, uh, feasible and usable size-wise and weight-wise and technically design and uh, manufacturing-wise, uh, it could push for the highest limit. And that is how we have the helmets that we have today available on the market. So Hong, I, I do have a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is that uh, on the large size helmets today, uh, many of the manufacturers, uh, well, I know Bell, they don't call it an extra large or a seven and three quarters. They sew it a seven and five eighths plus. And I think this has something to do with FIA. Can, can you speak to that? Do you know what I'm saying? Um, every dumb, uh, helmet, uh, I'm not sure about FIA regulations because I'm not expert. Maybe Ed would be the uh, right person to answer this technically more, more detail. What I can explain to you is what a snail does. So when we receive a helmet, 
the manufacturers uh, would have to tell us what is the circumference size for this specific helmet. Because we don't certify company and we don't certify a brand name. We don't certify a line of product. We certify each helmet by the dummy size that is certified to, okay? So sometimes one specific helmet structure, by that I mean the shell and the foam, impact foam liner are identical. And the only difference is the pads, these uh, comfort pads to uh, size uh, up the helmet for commercial sizes. So as many of you are experienced racers, you understand some of the pads are thinner and some of the pads are thicker. This is how uh, some of the manufacturers uh, reduce their manufacturing cost because each one unique size uh, combination between the shell and the liner uh, is a different mode. And every time they design a different mode and during production change a mode, uh, cost them money. So they size up these for their own uh, manufacturing and marketing uh, uh, goals. And as we receive them, if the helmet is uh, sized up for multiple sizes, even though their uh, liner foam and the shell are identical, we have to test it each of those commercial sizes. So if a helmet is truly a medium and they are sold from extra small or small, then we will test on the, the other sizes as well. And if the helmet say this is really their largest size and they uh, cushion it up to sell also for um, large or uh, extra large and double XL, they are essentially the same. They are also subject to J, M, and O dummy head form testing. So in other words, from our point of view, whatever they call them does not really matter because some of them sell by the centimeter, some of them sell them by just a designation of a L or a double XL or XL. And what we treat them here is which helmet dummy is going to be tested on. So if the helmet is really a triple or double XL that gets on the old head form, then that would be tested. Does that answer your question, Andy? Yeah, no, that was a good explanation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, what uh, they say, it doesn't matter. So you have to try the helmet on yourself in the shop and don't just buy the uh, size that they gave you. Okay, we talked about the standards, but standard is just a document. It's a, it's a booklet, literally, and it spells out all the specifications, the requirements, how each test should be conducted, and what are the criteria that we use to pass or fail a specific uh, helmet uh, for that uh, specific test. So, it goes, what really goes on that I'm going to show you later is how strict those tests are done. Who does the test? It does matter. For some of you that uh, also do motorcycle riding, uh, might understand that, you know, in the United States, DOT, the Department of Transportation, uh, have their own standard for motorcycling helmets in the United States. And they do publish this federal law, basically. Uh, what the standard is, but they don't do any testing. DOT uh, standard allows the manufacturer to do the testing and certify themselves. So here at Snell, all the helmets that are certified with the Snell name must go through the rigorous testing conducted at the Snell lab by Snell test technicians. And our test technicians are trained to fail every helmet that does not deserve the snail name. And the reason is that we will have to conduct random sample tests later 
for all the certified helmets that are available to the public randomly. No manufacturers know when, where, and uh, we are going to get which helmet for random sample test. And when it failed, three more would be uh, acquired to duplicate that failure. And if any one of the three fails, that line, uh, that specific helmet is decertified. And everybody knows because we update our public list. And so everybody can see this or that specific helmet as of which day has been decertified. So the competence and the experience our test technician matters a lot. And we also have this ISO certified lab that really uh, demonstrate that we subject our lab to outside professional scrutiny and we know what we are doing and how we do it is the correct way to do uh, test in the lab condition. So testing and more testing is really what matters here after we uh, discuss how demanding the standard is. So the certification program, like I explained earlier, is really voluntary by manufacturers. Nobody has to have a snail certified helmets and um, they have other choices too, like FIA and uh, SFI and um, have their own standard. But the tough standard here means that the manufacturers submit the helmet multiple sample, uh, uh, samples, same identical helmets to the lab. So we have one in hot condition, one in cold condition, one in room temperature, one in wet condition, and they all subject to the test that the, um, at the four locations uh, with double impacts. And also one is subject to flame testing for uh, the uh, auto racing helmets. And uh, all of them would go through the face shield penetration and face shield fireproof test and the retention test. And these are all destructive tests, of course. Uh, they are also non-destructive tests like the visual port, visual clearance up and down, left and right, uh, that also have to be uh, tested, measured on different size dummies so that um, if the helmet was uh, too small, and even if it get, I mean, the visual port is too small, if it sits on a large dummy head, then the visual clearance would be obstructed and failed for that criteria alone. And, um, so all these tests done on the same day, everything pass, then the manufacturers enter an agreement with a snail and that means their helmets in the market will be subject to random sample tests. And that is the assurance that we give ourselves and the public that the helmets on the market continue to perform up to the snail standard. So um, this is the snail lab uh, today. We have a ro robot built in house to mark up the test line anywhere on and above the test line is subject to impact test uh, location selection. Uh, as you know, like different helmet, especially in auto racing, uh, they fit uh, same shell and uh, foam liner combination fits on various different size uh, uh, for commercial use. So we do put them on different size dummies to make sure the visual port is clear and the lines are drawn correctly. As you can see, a helmet that is too big, if it uh, is put on a small dummy, then the whole helmet sits very much lower and the line would be different. And so we would deal with uh, the manufacturers like, hey, this helmet is not supposed to be on this dummy. And that kind of communication goes on a lot between the lab and uh, inexperienced manufacturers. Um, I'll give you a more close look here so that uh, the, maybe my camera later won't show the detail. 
as you see inside the dummy, this dummy is made of a, a magnesium alloy, very expensive, uh, more than uh, $2,000 a piece. And inside is the housing ring that buckles this uh, ball arm onto the dummy so that the ball uh, rotates inside this um, uh, basket so that it can facilitate the turning of the helmet on different uh, side and uh, open these uh, locations for impact on this impact stand. And inside this uh, silver ball is the accelerometer that measures the G-force that passes through the helmet and the dummy and sen uh, the sensor collects it and uh, the wires uh, connected the, the data collection into the computer. So on this test stand here, uh, this is the velocity gate. There's a little uh, black finger-like thing cut through the laser because this is one centimeter. So we measure how long the laser is cut off to measure the impact velocity. So on each impact, this gate is automatically adjusted. So the, this velocity measurement is collected right before the impact. It's very accurate. And um, for auto raising, the helmet impact would be subject to hemispherical anvil, flat anvil, and row bar. This is the row bar anvil that uh, each helmet gets uh, three whack at the same location, kind of simulating uh, in a crash, somebody's uh, helmet uh, made contact with the row bar inside the car multiple times. And uh, the flame test on the face shield and on the outside paint and the trim and the strap is also performed to make sure the material selection for auto racing helmets uh, really um, would uh, meet the, our standard requirement. It has to be uh, extinguished by itself within the time limits and uh, sis, uh, not being burned through uh, with the time limits. As you see here, it's a very powerful uh, propane gas a torch and it has to uh, block this flame penetrating, burning through. Uh, I forgot the time, I think it's uh, 40 some seconds or 50 some seconds that hopefully give enough time for the uh, rescue team to get to the driver. And here is the uh, Hans neck support system being tested. The rivets uh, has to uh, stay intact uh, with the extreme powerful force uh, pulled on the, the uh, fixture. Oops. And the retention test we'll see later. Also, this uh, helmet is put onto this retention rig. Uh, they've got two mass weight on here. One was uh, to uh, elong uh, just uh, pull out the excess space for one minute. Then the big mass get dropped like a big yank and uh, there is a digital linear uh, me measurement of how long the strap elongated uh, to see if it exceeded the, the uh, length that's allowed. And also to make sure the rivets and the buckle and the sewing all stay intact. The purpose for the helmet uh, strap system is to uh, stay on the head. And the penetration test also uh, is like an impact test, except at this time, uh, the helmet could be uh, strike uh, uh, by this uh, very sharp falling uh, uh, anvil. Uh, it's like the anvil turned upside down, basically. This is the velocity gate as well. So the helmet also is, is placed on this uh, um, device that facing up or facing down and pulled with this mass drop to make sure the helmet doesn't roll off. This is uh, more important for a motorcycle helmet uh, tests. Uh, 
usually it's really checking the anchor point of the rivets is placed in the right place for design features. And uh, penetration is uh, done through an air uh, rifle that shoots a pellet uh, somewhere, uh, I think it's 450 or 70 feet per second uh, at the face shield and it should not penetrate. This is a failure. It looks pretty bad, but it can happen, especially uh, in uh, motorcycling uh, on public roads or racing uh, in the fields, not on uh, the um, track. But sometimes when the crash happens, you know, other cars with other cars, so there are debris flying around that could also hurt other racers as well. So these are the dummy heads of various sizes and the housing ring and uh, the um, drop arm. And the drop arm after uh, so many impact tests, it does get metal fatigue and uh, would be out of service if uh, uh, we notice uh, it's not getting uh, good test results. And these are one-time uh, items uh, disposable. But the helmet dummy is really expensive. And uh, when they get cut and dinged like this, it doesn't really affect uh, the data collection. So we keep those. Um, before I get to the how helmet works, uh, let me walk you to the lab so you can see the real lab test sequence here. OK. I will stop share here and come back to this. Okay, I'm on. Can everybody see on the big screen? Hello? Yes, all right, so Hong, uh, everyone, if you go to the uh, speaker view, uh, Hong, we're still seeing your empty chair. Oh. Let's see, no, there we go. All right, now we're good. And uh, for some of you, if you, if you can, uh, Uh, yeah, if you pin this view, then uh, otherwise, whoever speaks shows up. Like you, Andy. So I'm walking to the lab now, and um, we'll show you how impact test and retention test is done. Good morning. Good morning, Larry. This is uh, Dominic. Dominic is going to demonstrate how a retention test is done first here. So, Dominic. Okay. See, as you see, this dumb, uh, helmet is uh, already strapped on here. The buckle is on. And Dominic is... Uh, putting, measuring um, the drop distance, make sure, it's 100. make sure is 120 millimeters where this mass is going to drop here and give this retention system a serious yank and see what happens. Yes. Okay. So here is uh, the trace for how the strap system uh, elongated because this is the huge uh, extension and then it's the rebound. But um, we also check the rivets here and the D-rings, everything looks good. And since the elongation is within the test the requirement criteria, which should peak to just a shy of uh, what, 20? Yeah, so this one passed. Did really well. Did very well. Okay, so here next, we are going to see a real impact test. 
this is the uh, velocity gate that I explained earlier. As you see, this black finger, when it cuts through, you see the blinking, it's the laser, it's got cut. And that um, measures the velocity create uh, measurement. And here we have this helmet on a hemispherical anvil. And um, these are the other anvils that helmets are subject to impact sometimes. And the technician will test every helmet on every surface under different conditions of temperature. What do you see here is a big chimney-like uh, drop uh, shoot here. And uh, this is going, computer is calculating how high this helmet has to get out there and coming down. So I'm going to wait here. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let's try it again. For the safety of our technicians, so we don't want this get on his head while he's working. So there's a safety pin on there. Oh, yeah. He forgot to take it off. So we'll do it again. <laughs> Normally we close the gate, but for a good view, I'm just staying here. Okay, that is one impact. And like I explained, each helmet would do two impacts at the same location at different velocities. And that's what's changed in 2020 standard. And here is that impact G-force trace. As you see, this one did very well. It is uh, reaching 113 peak G. quite below what we are seeing um, from the cutoff. So 300 G is yeah. the um, cutoff, so yes. So this is what a helmet has to go through here for certification. And I'm going to show you also the reading on the conditioning box. This is a hot box. 50 degrees Celsius is uh, what the helmet is in here for. So this is not a freezer. This is actually a hot box. And this one is a cold box, but I don't believe the, this is uh, actually set for a motorcycle helmet. Uh, it's minus, uh, okay, yeah, supposed to be minus uh, 20 centigrade for a um, motorcycle helmet. And we also have, um, let me see, a water. Can you turn on the water here? Yeah. So for wet conditioning, there is a box here for a helmet to get on uh, the wet conditioning, like a shower. So all of these uh, natural uh, temperature or wet conditioning is uh, for at least the duration of four hours to 24 hours. These are tested helmets that is going to see through the lock splitter before it goes to the garbage dump. And um, let me walk a little bit through here um to the shooting uh, gallery side 
So here is the archive room. Every helmet that's been certified have an uh, intact brand new uh, sample, like a library here. We mark every helmet uh, like a book. And when the helmet fails the test in random sample test, we pull out this archive sample and use it to compare with the failed sample. So we are not just relying on the manufacturer's uh, uh, report on what went wrong when we decide to, uh, to recertify the helmets or if the manufacturer has other problems. So I will walk through here to give you a close look at to the measuring device that we see on the slide. Here are the different size dummies that the helmets are put on when uh, they are drawing the test line and selecting impact site. And these are the uh, guide for measuring the visual port clearance, the upper and lower and the uh, peripheral vision. And a lot of the helmets on the shelves here, as you see already have the uh, uh, company boxes on. These are for random samples and the UPS brings these helmets through the back door. And here is a, currently a research test stand for rotational impact test. If some of you are into motorcycling, there is a lot of uh, talk about that. This is uh, one of the setting. We have the wires are connected to the dummy and the helmets uh, put onto this uh, cradle and dropped here. And so the helmet uh, with the dummy inside bounce around a lot. So we have a lot of cushioning around it. And here is another these are all experimental, not a real uh, test. See, here's the uh, velocity gate. Here's the oblique impact surface and the cradle for the helmet. This one is built for a dummy that has no wire. It's a wireless dummy that can uh, bounce around by itself. And the data collected is uh, in this device inside the dummy. So we just download by plugging in to get the test data. And that is the latest, uh, hopefully we'll get to use this uh, in future standard. Um, I think this is basically what I want to wrap up here in the lab and get back to other issues. And hopefully um, for some of you have chances to come to the Snell Lab or in Northern California, please come to visit. We'll give you a show and tell right here. And thank you, Dominic. No problem. Okay, Andy, I'm going to sign off here and go back to my office. Okay, very good. So Hong is uh, now walking back down the hallway. Um, if you have any questions, again, just uh, raise your hand. Um, I think, that, I mean, the big takeaway here is <clears throat> this is the real deal. They're not, uh, they're not relying on the manufacturer's honesty. They're keeping the manufacturer honest. So it, welcome back, Hong. Uh, my question to you would be, so what's it cost for a manufacturer to, I mean, if you don't mind sharing, what does it cost to, to do a helmet? It, Snell is a nonprofit organization. All the financial side is really pop, uh, for public scrutiny. Everybody can request a, uh, like the, the 1040 sort of uh, for an organization uh, to see the current uh, operation, but for each company's cost of testing, that's also public information on our website. You can actually see the price chart there. For an auto hel uh, helmet set to be tested,
they sent at least six samples of an identical size for all these tests that I mentioned, because it's destructive. So every helmet can only get so much done to it, but there will be at least one helmet for hot, uh, cold or room temperature, or wet conditions. So we need that many samples and one would be in the archive, right? If that whole set passes. So for one set, I believe somewhere just over $2,000. So for each helmet size tested, it's two, about $2,000. And that is good for the entire five year uh, updating uh, period, unless the helmet fails the RST test and fails the follow up of the RST, then that helmet is cert decertified. Sometimes, manufacturers would find out what's wrong with their product is failing and try it again. And that needs to be recertified. So whatever helmet also uh, had modification, like somebody decide to open up a vent somewhere else or uh, make a different mode. So the aligner now is thicker or thinner here and there. That's also a new helmet. So once it passed, it should not have any change except the paint job. So that's the price structure for the certification of the entire uh, uh, size uh, for the duration of the time that they are still valid certification. For each helmet during production, the sticker that you see cost the manufacturers about $2 for each helmet to have that sticker in there, it's serialized that help us trace the random sample because um, otherwise we wouldn't know how many helmets are sold, right? So we would test at least one out of 2000 helmet out there. So those serial numbers will tell us what they are making. And they also quarterly submit the quantity and uh, the distribution area of these helmets that are certified. So we know where to go after certain helmets that we want to test. That answers your question? Well, that's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So for you as a user, um, I'm sure you all have your favorite uh, manufacturers because everybody's head shape and size are different. Uh, so uh, for you to really find out, uh, you know, whose helmet is certified and whether that company is uh, uh, trustworthy or making good helmet uh, uh, consistently, you can go to the snail website and see if there's a previous uh, report of a failed uh, random sample or decertified product out there. So most manufacturers on auto racing they really have very good track record. You don't really see uh, major um, problems. And because uh, so for us, even if the helmet just fails for one G, for instance, so like 300 G is a pass and fail, right? We don't rate the helmet. So if it's one, a 300 zero one G, it failed. It, sorry, you know, in the real world, uh, you just have to design a make helmet that doesn't even get close to 300G. Like you see the previous uh, view on that impact, it was only uh, 120G, right? So, but that is only on that impact on a room uh, a ambient temperature. So if you put the helmet in a hot chamber, put it on the hemispherical handle impact, it will look a lot worse. And they have to pass the flat impact as well. So even if it's on a hot uh, conditioned unit for testing on flat impact, it may not affect it at all. So our job here is to uh, select uh, the worst treatment for each specific helmet uh, for that size and for that condition. So our test technicians are very experienced in, in doing these kind of a dis, uh, test uh, making such decisions. Any other questions regarding testing? 
So let's move on quickly. I want to, because uh, you are all so experienced and a lot of younger racers looking up to you to give them information. So I hope to give you some uh, uh, material here that can be handy when you come uh, to these uh, educational opportunities. So basically the, the helmet works uh, by using space and time concept. And there are videos on the SNAIL uh, YouTube channel that can, you can look at the entire certification process of motorcycle helmet, which uh, is identical in terms of the type of test, except that there's no flame test on there, okay? We don't have a uh, auto racing certification testing uh, video made yet. I think I'm going to uh, make up the shortcomings there soon so that the auto racers can see uh, these aspects such as uh, multiple three impacts on the row bar and uh, flame tests uh, that are unique to auto racing helmet uh, certification. So space and time. Um, as you know, you, you put a thumbtack into the wall, your thumb and the wall actually are receiving the same force but your thumb is not hurt. It's because the, the spread out space onto your thumb is thousands of times bigger than what the wall is receiving, which is a very sharp pointing contact point. So what a shell does is to work like the thumbtack on the finger side to spread the loading to a larger surface area so that the foam underneath the surface area of receiving this energy uh, would come to work to manage that impact uh, energy. So the time is really uh, to slow down the deceleration rate of the brain inside the helmet. You, you are in the car, you all understand how much easier to bring the car down to a slow a deceleration rate by having more taps on the brake, taking longer time. And that's what the liner does. By crushing up the liner and the time used to crushing up the liner, the brain comes to a gentler stop. It's not how hard the impact is, it's really how slowly the brain comes to the full stop. So let me see. Oops. That's the thumbtack works uh, that the shell does to spread out the load. You can try it with a slipping a quarter uh, between your uh, nail and the plywood and pound it down in the workshop and, and get the same effect. And uh, the penetration is only one type of uh, the impact related um, injuries, but the uh, bleeding inside the brain is really because the severe um, dislocation of the blood vessels, like stretching to uh, beyond the tolerance level of the blood vessel that brings uh, bleeding into the uh, situation. So by slowing down and extend uh, the, the uh, final stop process and bring that stretching and pushing and pressing into the natural tolerance of the softer tissues inside the skull is crucial, a work done by the liner. So here is a cross section of the helmet that's been subjected to lab testing. And here on the top, you see a minor impact that collapsed the liner a little bit. And uh, here is a major impact in the front. And as you see, these foam is practically the same like those uh, coffee cups. Uh, and you can see those little beads inside. It's really made of literally hundreds and thousands of little bubbles. For those of you who have played with the packing materials, like between your thumb, you kind of crush it. That's what the head does in the process of a crashing. 
it pops all these little bubbles inside this uh, uh, crushing zone between the shell here, spreading that one location on impact center to a much larger area and bring all these foam bubbles underneath this impact uh, extended air space into play to the crush time to decelerate more gently and make let the energy go to do the destructive work in popping the bubbles rather go straight to the head so all this happens very quickly within usually seven milliseconds that's one thousandth of one second so that's one thing I tell the motorcyclist, you know, you think you are so experienced when the crash, hap crash happens, you can do this and that. Actually, it happens so quickly, there's no reflex time. You can just uh, uh, tr hopefully trust the safety gear to help you see through the other side of this crushing uh, tunnel. So here's a close look at the wireless dummy that we are are having fun with lately and uh, getting very repeatable, reliable data now. And hopefully um, we will get to use uh, some of this uh, to tell us more about what these helmets can or cannot do, or uh, then figure out what we should ask uh, uh, the manufacturers to do by putting certain uh, criteria into future standards. So as I said earlier, SNELL is a nonprofit organization. We test for public safety. So the existence of this organization is really based on public trust on what we do. And so uh, we publish our, uh, on our website the entire certification list for various type of helmets. So you can actually see on a daily basis what is currently certified. And um, all the test uh, certified helmets public, uh, on the published side has name of the model and the size specific uh, organized alphabetically by the helmet manufacturer's name. And we do publicize decertified helmets name. As I said earlier, because these helmet uh, test when it's technically failed like 301G, or 300 or 5G, it's really total failure as far as we are concerned. <clears throat> but in the medical sense, it's really not public safety hazard out there. As you all know, the motorcycle helmet standard published by government DOT uh, is set the peak G criteria at 400 G. So, Sometimes, is, uh, in addition to publish the certification, just a second. <coughs> Excuse me. We we do. Uh, <coughs> announce, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, decertification um, helmet. In addition, we do uh, organize recalls by manufacturers. <clears throat> so many of you who have friends or yourselves had experienced crashes realize the value of these protective headgear. This is a signed card uh, given to me by this famous guy. I'm sure a lot of you recognize him. The daredevil, Evil Knievel. <clears throat> he has crashed many times uh, wearing snail certified helmets. So the key is try your best not to have any crashes uh, in your way. And if it happens, hopefully your safety gear see you through. And here's 
again, I want to emphasize that our mission is uh, use evidence-based scientific finding to guide our standard establishment and our testing certification program. And the premium helmets protection is what we ensure uh, on offer to the public as a guidance for helmet selection. And as a nonprofit organization, injury prevention education has always been part of the Snell Foundation mission. And um, for me, one of the uh, program is the Snell Ambassador Program. And I wish uh, those of you who would like to join the program, contact me at uh, my email, uh, send me an email, and uh, I will add you to the future communication list for our ambassadors. Uh, a couple of times in a year, no more than three times, usually a year, um, I would uh, give everybody an update of what's the latest uh, at the Snell Foundation in terms of a standard update or other things that might be of interest. And uh, those of you who wants to join, I'll be happy to send you a Snell shirt and a hat. So uh, you could use it as an icebreaker when you uh, have a helmet safety specific uh, opportunity out there. So we don't make helmets and we make helmets safer by what we do here. And uh, our existence and operation really depend on public support. And I thank you for having me today. And uh, hopefully with your support and thousands of people out there, we'll continue to do uh, our work here and uh, continue the mission since uh, the foundation was uh, set up in 1957. And here are a few do's and don'ts <clears throat> with helmet to improve uh, personal uh, safety. Replace helmet every five years. Um, wear and tear is really the guide here. And uh, a lot of people who um, use it very uh, gingerly a few times a year, you know, not like uh, and uh, people going through the Baja racing, <laughs> they probably can't stand their helmets after two, three years uh, uh, being uh, in that environment. Uh, it just stinks like uh, really bad. And um, fastening the chin strap is very important. As you uh, see, the test is done. You know, you don't want to have too much excess under your chin uh, because uh, it really uh, extends the elongation and movement of the helmets during a crash. And clean your helmet inside, only use water and soap, nothing else that's strong um, might deteriorate the plastic uh, beads uh, the, in the foam in the inside. And don't cut or alter the helmet liner at all to fit your specific head shape. If a helmet doesn't fit, some people who has a typical Caucasian head for shape, like uh, the uh, measurement from the front to the back is longer than the measurement from left to right, uh, you probably should try a different uh, make, a different manufacturer to fit you better. And I've seen motorcyclists literally hammering down the forehead just to give himself a couple of uh, meters of space in there. It's absolutely horrifying to see that. And uh, don't put your helmet close to hot surfaces like the muffler or the uh, engine because the plastic foam inside literally melt down uh, completely. It would have no use uh, when a crash happens. And um, for more information, please visit the Snell YouTube channel for some more short test video or the long lab tour video and uh, understand uh, more detail what Snell certification program uh, entails. And uh, the best, come here for a lab tour anytime, literally. We welcome anybody. Just give us a call, tell us when you'll be here. We will give you a live tour here uh, with the demo helmets. And uh, 
Uh, we do have Facebook and Twitter. I don't do a lot of posting, um, but um, sometimes anything interesting happen with the visual, I do make a few posts. And uh, we always have people answer our phones. There's no recording or push this button to go to so-and-so. Uh, any call from the public is very important to us. It could save somebody's life with uh, the right choice of gear. So the last word is your consumers and riders and drivers out there really have no way to size up a helmet at a sales point. The snail label is really our guarantee that we stand behind every helmet with a snail label because we checked it before it's marketed in the first place and we follow up with these uh, random sample tests to assure ourselves and the public those helmets sold in the market continue to meet our standard. It, it's an indirect indication to you that that is what snail standard uh, means. Uh, but all helmets that tested here are just meeting the snail standard. As we all know, there are unforeseeable events out there that impact severity exceed what a helmet is designed to handle. And um, that is just a, a fact of life. And we do things that are risky, but we do it in the safest way that we can protect ourselves. And that way we can enjoy what we do. So I think this brings to the end of my uh, presentation here. And if anybody has questions, please raise your hand so Andy can direct to you. Well, we're waiting for someone to, to raise their hand. I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, do you have an opinion or can you share anything about uh, a carbon fiber helmet by a fiberglass or any other materials, a composite shell? Not really, because uh, the way we have an opinion basically after testing is that whether our dummy complaints, right? So by having a fiberglass or carbon shell or just um, Kevlar, you know, sometimes they advertise them, their goal is to do what the shell is supposed to do. And that is the spread the load. So yes, we all know the harder carbon shell made well can spread the load better. But the way the manufacturers compete with each other is that they really try to pass the helmet test with the least amount of helmet material used in the process. So some people will advertise saying that, oh, this way exceeds snail lay, uh, requirement. That is not true. So what they do is once they use a carbon shell or certain shell material that really works well, they basically can afford to thin out the helmet, you know, so the helmet doesn't look as bulky or that because the shell itself is heavier, because it's thinner, the helmet weigh less too. So these are the selling points and, and the, the challenge for the manufacturers. So they basically nobody builds more than what Snell asked for. So we totally understand that. And that's why we keep raising the bar whenever the update comes up that is possible for them to do. So they're competing them, uh, with other manufacturers to really make a lightest, thinnest silhouette or the you know, less expensive helmet than the other guy. And they all meet the snail standard. And that is the challenge. So that question like, is the carbon fiber helmet shell is going to do better than the fiberglass one? From our test point of view, no, it doesn't. It meets the same standards. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I see that Mary Zeitner has her hand up. Mary? 
you need to do a course on mute yourself. There you go. And the highly unlikely, turning off the speaker there, <laughs> in the highly unlikely uh, possibility of the uh, flame or anything reaching the inside of the helmet. Um, the inside of the helmet. <laughs> it, it, is that foam material uh, fire or flame resistant? Yes, the, the, the fabric uh, oh, for the okay. pads and all that, if it catch fire and keeps burning, that fails. So when we test the helmet for the flame test, it will have the torch right on the trim, on the edge of the helmet, right? So the, the, the like the pads on under the, the trim and along uh, the uh, edge of the helmet, it will definitely catch fire if uh, it, it's um, tested with, uh, and it, it goes it, uh, extinguish itself and not keep burning, then it's a pass within the time limits. So they do have to use material that's not commonly used for motorcycle helmets, for instance. And that is why the auto uh, racing helmets tend to be more expensive. It's those uh, fire resistance material that they use uh, throughout the helmet. Okay, great. So Mary, you can take your hand down now, if you will, unless you have another question. Okay, you can plug in again. Well, no, I've lost it. No, oh, you lost the program? Now you're not muted. Yep. You and Phil are not muted. Okay. Uh, Zong, it looks like, uh, Hong, it looks like you had a couple of other slides that you might want to share. Oh, okay. Um, glad I have time. I have uh, and it, there's no... So uh, for those of you who are interested in more details of these uh, research that we have done on motorcycle helmet, I want to share a few slides here. Uh, this is a published study at uh, our ICROBI uh, conference in uh, Lyon, France in uh, uh, 20, uh, 2015. Um, what it did was uh, we tested helmets that are only DOT certified to um, uh, US federal government minimum standard. And at that uh, time, because it was the, at the end of uh, 2015, we're still using the uh, 2010 helmets uh, for motorcycling. We tested these helmets in ambient condition. These are medium sized helmets on both the flat anvil, like shown here, and the hemispherical anvil data shown here. So what we see here is that when we impact the helmet at very low velocity, like three meters per second here starting, and at the interval here, five, seven, eight, nine, we collect these uh, peak G values and see how the dummy tell us uh, what it feels. So, some of the mystery stories people tell out there is that snail helmets are for racers. And so it might do well in handling high impact levels, but not so well in the uh, less uh, in, uh, severe impact. Like everybody uh, think the flat surface on the street uh, is going to be more gentle, which I don't quite agree. Uh, the road service is a lot more risky than uh, racing uh, environment, in my opinion, and uh, some of you might agree. So, but this data shows uh, in the low level impact here, three meters to six meters per second, because DOT uh, is right um, below six meters per second. The performance on these peak G value is about the same, okay? But once you test the beyond what the DOT helmets standard ask for, you see the performance of the DOT only helmets start to go up, okay? But not a huge difference. 
This is because when you test helmet only on the flat surface, you are trying to see how soft and hard the liner is. Okay, so this is only one situation. The challenge for manufacturer is that snail tests on multiple different surfaces and at a higher drop velocity. So those are more severe uh, treatment. And in the next slide, what do you see is same thing. At the lower level, the, the peak G is low, below the DOT level, about 5.758 meters per second. But they all low, almost identical performance in terms of holding the peak G down. But then you can see the snail blue line stays way below the DOT helmet response in performance, especially when it gets close to the snail test uh, level, that's 7.75 meters per second for uh, motorcycling. Uh, like in auto racing, we hit it harder than motor, uh, motorcycling helmets. It really start to take off astronomically. So this is going through the roof, okay? So basically, this is median size room temperature. If it's a larger size, hot condition, you would see this red line starting to peak really earlier. So this is what the difference is uh, when you have a minimal standard or have the premium standard. The helmet just can't see through these tougher uh, and higher severity conditions. And that translate into this kind of a level of protection. If we use, this is the current 2020 uh, snail standard for motorcycle. If we use that as the baseline for 100% of what the best protection is available out there now, DOT standard helmets only comes to slightly over half of what snail standard helmets do. And the ECE European standard is even worse. And a lot of uh, people have this assumption there, anything European is better than United States, it, which is not true in this uh, helmet business. And we use the ECE standard as the baseline, 100% in this green column here. That's how the DOT in red and Snell in blue stacks up. So helmet made to the DOT standard is slightly more protective in the smallest size and more protective in the largest size. So these are the extra small, these are triple XL, okay? And as you remember what I explained earlier, why the heroic size headed people are not protected as well as the smallest ones, because we squeeze out as much protection as possible for each dummy size based on uh, the acceptable level of weight and silhouette that the public is willing to wear. And here is still 40% more than the DOT uh, level of protection in the largest size. And what I want to explain is how helmet works and helmet didn't work, uh, but I didn't explain how helmet didn't work, what it looked like. So we are in Northern California. We really live by the protection of our huge dams upstream. <laughs> and Imagine a helmet works when the hel uh, dam fails, okay? And not fail by what we normally see, like we imagine the water rise behind the dam to the very top and when it fails, we assume it's because the water coming over the top like a waterfall. Basically the only excessive amount of water coming over. But in a helmet sc scenario, Whenever the total impact energy reach to the very top of what the helmet is designed to protect, that extra 
over the limit of the designed capacity means catastrophic failure. Just imagine what another millimeter of water over the top of a dam is going to bring down the entire dam. That's how you should appreciate this 40% here. Okay, hey, we have a couple of uh, questions. I see Roger Cadell has his hand up. Roger? Thank you, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Perfect, great great presentation, Hong. I, I'm uh, very intrigued by some of the stuff that you've shared here today, very interesting. My question is on, on helmet replacement. I, I don't race anymore, but when I used to race, it was off-road racing. You talked about Baja in the desert racing. And um, the, the, the helmet is not taking a large, uh, often is not taking that large hit onto the, to a rolled bar or, a, you know, or, or, or the ground. But we get sometimes, especially in the short course racing, the a rock comes up and hits it and maybe it chips the paint. How, what is the uh, criteria? What, what would you suggest as far as replacement of helmets when things like that? And it happens on road course and open wheel cars as well, right? Yeah. What do you think about that? Uh, the impact to the head, the head is inside the helmet. Impact, anything that's not moving is what damages the liner. Basically, the liner is in the like in between two hard places, and it's the something stops the movement of the outside of the helmet shell, and the head with its mass crushing from the inside towards that stopping location is what damages the helmet. So, I would say if just a glancing rock on the outside, it's not going to be as severe as even like you walk in your garage, not at any velocity and you slip and you hit your head on the concrete floor, that helmet is done, finished. You need a new helmet. That's very interesting. I've had some hits before with, uh, you know, just pebbles that come up that I don't even feel them, right? Mm -hmm. But when I get back at the end of the race and you're white cleaning your helmet up, the, the paint is chipped. And uh, so we always ran them, but I don't know if that was uh, the best idea. It sounds like uh, something we ought to think about. Yeah, when, uh, when we consider the structure damage to the helmet liner and shell, it's really when the head impact to something solid or even soft, like somebody uh, is on a racing track that's uh, you know padded with uh, uh, just sand and they come off, they don't really feel like, oh, that was a hard impact. They, they, they're cushioned somewhat by the surface uh, of a sand and something that's moving and they didn't feel like it's uh, damaging anything, especially at a lower velocity but actually that is bad. Interesting, Th thank you very much. Is there a place to get helmets checked after you think you yes. might've had some sort of a hit? Usually manufacturers, especially larger manufacturers do have those uh, uh, services. So you contact them for examination. They have uh, their way of even uh, detaching the liner in a safe way to look at the inside. You know, for, for you as a user, uh, the best thing you can do is really just look at the inside of the liner, if you can really look inside and see if there's any hairline fractures or dent, you know, if uh, you uh, got hit some uh, stuff that you think is pretty uh, serious. But usually you can't see. Like uh, the slide I showed earlier, there's a minor a uh, small uh, dent in the foam. You won't see this one on the top. You can't see anything from inside, but that liner has been quite severely compromised. That collapsed bubble in that area is not going to work again. That's why we uh, advise uh, people on motorcycle or you know, race car uh, car racers don't do it as often to uh, put the helmet on the mirror or handlebar uh, from the inside. Use it as a headrest because every time you put the helmet on these hard surfaces, the liner on from the inside get pump punctured right here in this area. So it will eventually look like this, 
and you just don't realize you are compromising that protective capability that's built into that helmet. Wow, thank, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Mel Kemper has his hand up and then we're just about running out of time. So Mel? Hi, um, I just have a general question. You mentioned the, the shape of the helmet. Um, some, some manufacturers are more round and some are more oval shaped. Um, I have a pretty round head, some might call fat. <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> um, is there any guidance or generalization about which manufacturers tend to, to go with one shape? And I ask because that would really help kind of reduce the number of different brand of helmets that I would have to try to, to give me a, a real proper fit. Well, there is not a really a good guidance on that. People's head are really different. Um, sure. You just have to try different makes in the shop to get to your own feeling. My advice is don't buy online. Uh, only buy after you visit the shop and have the helmet on your head for at least five to 10 minutes, walk around and uh, feel no pressure point. A helmet should be snug. It really should not be super comfortable and cushioning because uh, those uh, pads in there will eventually, uh, within a use of a few months, uh, uh, come down so that uh, it will actually be uh, one size too big for you uh, after a year. And if you plan to use it for longer, uh, it will maybe even two size too big. So you should know the best uh, sh uh, size and shape, and also maybe find out what is the shell size for your head. See, different uh, manufacturers have different cutoff. Some of them only even have like two size shell and liner and just use a lot of pads inside for commercial sizes. Right. So if you find out, well, say this medium is a true medium that I'm using. And uh, when the pads break down, I still get the best helmet that is suitable for me. For some other manufacturer, maybe they have three different uh, shell sizes and that medium maybe is the same as the large. So you don't really know until you find out these details. Right, thank you. And Amber. for motorcycle helmets, I know Arai has round, round, and over round uh, liner and shell design. Uh, I'm not so sure about their auto racing because uh, auto racing manufacturing quantity is a lot smaller. It really gets to be very expensive if they get uh, you know different size and also shape uh, to use different uh, molds. Thank you, Hong. That was great. Okay, well, Hong, you have been outstanding, and uh, I hope everyone's gotten a whole lot out of it. Um, and so, I mean, at at this point, then uh, I guess we're about done. So uh, uh, it's about break time. Why don't uh, let's all give Hong a, a big hand. You can clap in real or you can hit your little uh, clapping icon there. Um, Hong, again, thank you very much. And uh, we're gonna take, um, gonna take a little break here before our next speaker. Thank, thank you. Thank you all very much. And remember, if you want to be a Snell ambassador, uh, write me an email at Hong, like Hong Kong, H-O-N-G, uh, and uh, smf.org. Thank you.